Hello, welcome to a new Read Along with Fulcrum Entertainment. I am Harrison Bullman, and I will be reading for you Batman Arkham Knight The Riddler's Gambit. To celebrate the release of The Batman, we are reading this book, a novelization tie in to the video game Batman Arkham Knight. Now, it is in fact a minor prequel to Arkham Knight, taking place in the events that happen between uh, Arkham City and Arkham Knight, and it involves the Riddler squaring off against Batman and trying to take the place of Joker, who has since passed and left a vacuum of power within the criminal land of Gotham City. While this is the first video, as we put out more ones, please Keep an eye on the description below. It will have links to each part and links to playlists. And in this read-along, as all the others, I will be asking questions because I want to hear what you guys think of the book and I want to chat about little topics with you, get your opinions. Um, the first one, of course, because we haven't started the book yet, but I do want to keep asking you questions. Let us know, have you seen The Batman? And, as spoiler-free as you can manage, let us know uh, what you thought of it. Perhaps give us a rating on a scale of one to five batarangs, what you thought the movie was like. I haven't seen it yet, but I will see it, and I will be discussing it this Sunday on the Fulcrum Entertainment Podcast with my boy Gilbert. Back to the comments. I'll be doing shout-outs of people in the comments throughout this series, continuing our conversations, adding it in, and furthering our questions. Please do respond to anyone else in the comments, and please respond to me. You will most likely get called out in the uh, video. But now that's out of the way, let's start reading. We begin with a prologue that is an article from Gotham Gazette. Bullseye by Rafael del Toro, GothamGazette.com I've never made any secret of my disdain for the so-called Batman, and I'm not going to start now. It's been months since we saw him screeching through the streets of our fair city in his bad car, or swooping around in Arkham City, attacking the Tiger agents charged with keeping civil order, or doing any of the other things he does to take the law into his own hands. In other words, it's been months since Batman has told us, the people of Gotham City, that we're not good enough or smart enough to take care of ourselves. Hooray! Let's hope he's on a long, long vacation. Maybe he decided to start a new career as a baker of artisanal donuts. Whatever happened to him, we can only hope that all of his bat doodads are gathering dust in his mother's basement. After what went down in Arkham City, it would be best if Gotham City never saw a costumed freak ever again. Any costumed freak. Am I the only one who's noticed that he seems to make everything worse instead of better? He shows up with his bad gear and his bad attitude, and the bad guys come crawling out of the woodwork to test themselves against him. Well, on behalf of the people of Gotham City, I say, No thanks, Batman, we're good. We don't need you giving the criminal lunatics another reason to improve their chops. The Joker's gone, and this whole mess with Hugo Strange took out a lot more of your year-round Halloween party, too. Good. If there are any more psychos out there, let them keep their costumes in their closets. Let them do something normal. Like rob banks. The Gotham City PD can handle that. Take a vacation, Batman. Make it a long one. Let Gotham City see what it's like when we don't have someone out there setting himself up as the perfect bat-winged target. Enough people died at Arkham City. You see, Batman hasn't been around for months now. Anyone else notice how quiet it's been? Refreshing, isn't it? So, if you're reading this in your bat tub on your eye bat or sitting in your bat kitchen, noshing on some bat toast, do us all a favor. Stay there. Stay home. Let the normal people work it out. Aren't you tired of being a vigilante? We're tired of being collateral damage in vigilante wars. Seriously, stay home. 
We'll take care of it from here. We good? Are we bat good? Glad to hear it. Wow, okay, well, quite a snotty prologue. Um, and a very, very J. Jonah Jameson sort of um, attitude there, which, you know, I think is often going to be the response to vigilantes. So let's move on to the actual beginning, to the real chapter one. The Riddler waited. He watched. He observed and recorded, and when he had seen enough, he began to form his observations into plans. How to transform a joke into a riddle. He sought the perfect spot to begin building on his previous machinations, and found it in the subterranean ruin of Wonder City. Once the city's lord and master, Raish al Ghul, no longer factored in, since Raish was dead, his Lazarus pit destroyed. Talia, the daughter of the demon, had vanished, and even the Joker was gone, up in smoke. Part of him mixed with the ever-present miasma of criminality that hung over Gotham City, even in fair weather. The rest had been flushed, merging with the water supply system. Thus he had become a permanent part of life's fabric. No doubt, the tiny particles of him that had escaped the crematorium had settled on the streets, the buildings, and even the denizens of Metropolis. In the truest of terms, one could not conceive of Gotham City without the Joker. That, as the Riddler saw it, was the problem. He, Edward Nigma, would be the solution. There was a vacuum at the very pinnacle of the Gotham City hierarchy of crime, and it was well known that nature abhorred a vacuum. So too did the Riddler, and therefore he would fill it. Another man might embark on a campaign of killings, he mused, or showy attacks on Gotham City landmarks. But that wasn't the Riddler's style. Instead, he viewed the situation the way a chess player viewed a board. There were three stages of chess. Funny, isn't it? How many things are conceived of as happening in threes, he thought. Perhaps, but no, first things first. The opening ten moves of a chess game, when played properly, were more or less pre-programmed because all of the options were so well known. If white played pawn to king four, a black wasn't going to answer by advancing his queen's rook pawn. Why? Because that was a sure way to lose. No, any competent player knew the ways to direct the early part of a game along predictable paths thus establishing a level playing field and a reasonable probability of success. The same principle applied to the end game. There were defined paths there as well. A king shepherding a pawn down the board against another king, or a rook sectioning the board to corner and defeat the enemy. Or the sacrifice that broke the castled king's line of pawns and opened the way for the diagonal strike of a bishop. One could see these stratagems coming several moves in advance, which was why so few real games ended in checkmate. The master player, recognising the inevitable, always resigned. At both the beginning and end, a chess game was predictable. But what about in between? The mid-game, where possibilities multiplied faster than the human mind could follow. That was where surprises could happen, and it was where games were won or lost. So first the Riddler framed the plan for his opening moves. They would involve building, which took time, but that was all right. The time was there. The city was still reeling from the explosive disintegration of Protocol 10 and the regime of Hugo Strange. Things were quiet. The Riddler would be quiet too. He would work behind the scenes and wouldn't implement his plan until it was ready. There would be the need for allies and there would be those who opposed him. He drew up lists of potential partners and of likely rivals. The entire roster of Gotham City's underworld would be given roles to play as pieces on the Riddler's board. He began to structure a series of puzzles 
each of which would hinge on the nature of a chosen ally. But he couldn't stop there. That would be too easy. The complexities had to be maddening, to the point of distraction. So he added another layer to the riddles, interweaving them into... Oh, yes, he thought. That will be brilliant. Nigma finalized his list of potential allies and began to reach out to them, designing each communication in a way that was sure to intrigue. From Wonder City, the Riddler sent out emissaries, and, as responses came back, he built his network. He recruited people he knew he could trust and could dispose of without compunction. He already knew how it would be done. Some of them he brought down to Wonder City, and the sight of it amazed them. Streets and buildings, many of them constructed in the 19th century, fallen into decay and ruin, located in the semi-darkness of the underground. The remnants of a bygone era, of a singular vision, all surrounding the ruins of the Wonder Tower, once the demon seat of power. Few residents of Gotham City even knew it existed. He put his growing army to work, paid them well, and conveniently neglected to mention that they would have a little bonus coming once this project was up and running. As for those to whom he did not reach out, they would have to be dealt with in some way, engaged, placated, or simply removed, whichever was more conducive to the success of the plan. Ra's al Ghul and the Joker had cast a long shadow, but Nigma had been preparing for years to step into a spotlight of his own making. The way was clear. This was his chance. He would not let it pass. Of course, there was the Batman. Too often he had crossed swords with the so-called Dark Knight, pitting his puzzles against the vigilante's wits. Not long ago, he had challenged Batman using specially constructed rooms, each designed around a specific theme. His opponent had surmounted the challenges fairly easily, as Riddler had anticipated he would, but past had been prelude. His observation of Batman's tactics had led to a new generation of traps, more elaborate than before. These would not require a human presence in order to be deadly. There would be a series of them, each self-contained, but contributing an element to a larger puzzle. Each trap would be more intricate, wearing his foe down, culminating in a revelation that would destroy him, if not physically, then with the sheer knowledge of what he had lost. The final trap would be a masterpiece. Would Batman resign? That was the real question. Would he know he was defeated and tip over his king? Or would he fight to the very end, proving both his valour and his stupidity? Either would result in sweet, sweet victory. Having gathered his resources, he had to find a location for his puzzle. He searched through both Arkham City and Wonder City, taking stock of what remained of each and found a wealth of raw materials ripe for the picking. Hugo Strange's tiger minions had left behind a mother load of equipment and material. Raish al Ghul's robotic wonders, dubbed the Mechanical Guardians, still stood their silent watch, waiting for someone to return them to a sense of purpose. Nigma would use it all. He would improve upon it. He would recreate it all and construct the puzzle to end all puzzles. Which was to say, the puzzle that would end Batman. He would need help. He wasn't such an egomaniac that he thought he could do it on his own. If he wanted to step into the vacuum left by the Joker, no. For decades the face of crime in Gotham City had been insane, wearing a mad rictus of green hair. The Riddler had no desire to step into those shoes. Like all the resources he was procuring, he would remake the role. Gone would be the lunacy, to be replaced by something a little classier. In the way a riddle was classier than a joke. 
Jokes relied on a brief incongruity, a momentary collision of expectation and reality. They stimulated the low behaviors of human nature. Not for nothing did they call it a belly laugh. A good riddle demanded intellect and reasoning. Fate had handed him the perfect opportunity. More than ever, he had the resources he needed to establish the Riddler's preeminence among Gotham City's criminal hierarchy in a way that would be incontestable. The chaos he would bring would make them forget the Clown Prince of Crime once and for all. A delusion of grandeur? So be it, he thought. All thoughts of grandeur were delusions, until one made them real. The corner of the steel mill gaped in a ruin of stone and metal, evidence of the explosion that had partially destroyed the building. Like the remains of the building, the armoured construct they had brought up from the below was scorched. But whereas the mill was inoperable, the mechanical guardian appeared to be intact. Looking like something out of a steampunk dream, the TikTok men were the perfect representatives of a technology well ahead of its time. They had been built ostensibly to protect the denizens of Ra's al Ghul's domain, where in truth they represented his despotic control. Round eyes were dull and lifeless now, but soon they would glow green again with artificial life. Perfect thought Nigma. If enough of them have survived, they'll be perfect. Immediately, he contacted the teams he had combing the abandoned streets, instructing them to find the rest. Brutish strength combined with the elegance of the gambit. It was the mark of a true genius. Anyone could achieve power with a gun or a knife. The perfect riddle commanded its recipient to act in one way and one way only. There was no greater mastery. And that was what the Riddler sought to achieve over Batman. Absolute mastery. Here, in the ruined splendor of Arkham City. And that ends chapter one. So chapter one there, setting up, okay, Riddler's making plans. This, not too uh, groundbreaking for the world of Batman, but what I do love is that they spent a lot of time in that chapter really tying it into the events of um, Gotham City, sorry, Arkham City. At the end of that, talking about Arkham City being there, talking about the Tiger Guards, Hugo Strange, and obviously really bringing in uh, Rachel Ghoul and Wonder City and the robots that were underneath. I wonder if we'll see anything of Talia, perhaps. Or did Talia die at the end of that game? Mm, can't remember. Um, I find it quite interesting how... Um, I feel it's quite accurate to the, the Riddler. I really love how aloof and how... He thinks he's so much better than everyone. And even the Joker, even though the Joker was obviously the greatest criminal in Gotham City for decades, it seems. Um... Him being like, ah, oh, well, I'm classier than the Joker. A riddle is far classier than a joke. That's, I love that. And it sort of really gets across the riddle. You know, he's like, he's too uptight. He like, you know, he might be able to succeed at one of his plans for once, if it were for the fact that he has to do it in a stupid riddle style that has to be the way he thinks it is because he thinks it's better. And, you know, like, if he could only see that, maybe he'd succeed sometime. Um, so really interesting to see that. Let's go on and see what gets established in Chapter 2. See how the story goes. Bruce Wayne mistrusted the calm. Gotham City had been quiet in the months since the Joker's death. It wasn't in the city's nature to be calm. There was always something brewing. Everyone from the ordinary street thugs to the organized crime families seemed to be less active than usual. It was almost as if the city was mourning the madman honouring his twisted legacy by abstaining from violence and chaos for a time. It seemed bizarre to contemplate, given the terror the Joker had inflicted on Gotham City over the past decades. But there it was. Facts, as the saying went, were stubborn things, and the fact was that Batman hadn't seen any of the rogues' gallery of costumed opponents since the cremation. Whether they were in mourning, or waiting to see how the power vacuum would be filled. 
That would remain to be seen. On a more personal level, yet just as disturbingly irrational as the city's apparent grief, Bruce was grappling with the psychological effect of the Joker's death. They had been mortal enemies for so long that he couldn't help but experience a kind of loss, twisted though it might seem. He was also dealing with the physical effects of the battles in and around Wonder City. As superbly conditioned as he was, even Bruce Wayne was getting a little older. He didn't recover as quickly as he once had. The fortunate lull in criminal activity was giving him time to rest his battered body and to deal with essential maintenance of his unique equipment. He was spending a lot of time in the Batcave, assisted by Robin and Alfred. They replenish supplies, repair damaged components, and replace any that couldn't be repaired. Regular orders for parts and tools went to Lucas Fox, CEO of Wayne Enterprises, and an engineering genius in his own right. When the lull ended, and he was certain it would, Batman would be ready. If I may say so, you're not your usual self, Master Bruce, Alfred said. How's that, Alfred? Well, sir, you're never a loquacious man, but in recent days you've been positively taciturn, an inward turn of mind, it seems. I must inquire, is all well? As well as it gets, Bruce replied. I don't trust this quiet. Me neither, Robin chimed in from under the Batmobile. But we don't have to trust it to take advantage of it. True enough, Master Tim, true enough, Alfred said. He waited for a moment, then, when the silence became awkward, he climbed the stairs and left the Batcave. He's right, you know, Tim Drake said. He usually is, Bruce responded. You're not yourself. Who else would I be, Robin? Bruce said, trying to be flip. It's nothing that should concern you. Yet, Robin and Alfred were right. There had been a real change in him. Other people might not have noticed it, but they knew him too well. He had to admit it to himself that it was there. The Joker's death was affecting him in unexpected ways. Was he grieving? Could that be it? It seemed ridiculous, but when you lost someone who was a part of your life, even if that person had spent decades trying to kill you, Perhaps it was natural to feel that loss. Maybe his condition was physical. He felt strong, he felt quick, but he also felt unwell, in a nebulous, unidentifiable way. He'd been writing it off as lingering effects of the Joker's toxins, and that still seemed the most likely cause. Whatever the source, four months after the collapse of Protocol 10, something was wrong. Sooner or later he would shake it off. Until he did, however, it would continue to frustrate him. He wasn't comfortable with a problem he couldn't solve, didn't like a foe he couldn't fight, couldn't even identify. I'm fine, Bruce said. And even if I wasn't, Gotham City doesn't care if Bad Matt isn't feeling up to par. He hoped that would end the conversation, and got his wish when the private line from Commissioner Gordon's office pinged. Commissioner, he said, activating the voice-only system. Batman, glad I caught you, Gordon said. I need you to come down here. We've got a, a situation and could use your expertise. I'll be there, he said. Then he broke off the call. Within minutes, he was suited up, and moments after that he was in the Batmobile. Before long, the armored vehicle was roaring through Gotham City, past Theatre Row, through Chinatown, skirting Amusement Mile and the casino. People turned to watch. Some cheered. Some cursed and made obscene gestures. In other words, everything was normal. Eleven minutes after leaving the Batcave, he arrived at the Gotham City Police Department headquarters and left the Batmobile parked on the street. It was a conscious decision on his part. After the exposure of Hugo Strange's tiger conspiracy four months before, he determined to make himself more visible. People needed to know that someone was watching, and not just watching, but taking action. 
there were still plenty of people who considered Batman a dangerous vigilante, but more of them viewed him as a warrior on the side of the law and order. At times, it seemed like a slim majority, but he'd spent years building it. He wasn't going to let it slip now. It seemed to be paying off, since criminal activity was at its lowest level in years. There were still tensions in the city, though. It didn't feel like a place where people went around their business freely and without fear. It felt as if there was another shoe about to drop. Batman had long ago learned to trust his instincts, yet he also had to acknowledge that he was edgy. Was he jumping at shadows? Something wasn't right. Whatever it was, however, he had to relegate it to the back of his mind. He made a point of walking in the front door of the GCPD headquarters. People would see that and recognize Batman as an ally of the police, one who responded when Commissioner Gordon summoned him. Protocol 10 had shaken the civil order, almost destroyed it in fact. Hundreds of Arkham City's inmates had died, many of them innocents who had run afoul of Hugo Strange's lunatic plan. Amidst the violence and chaos, a number of genuinely dangerous criminals had escaped. Batman had been rounding them up as fast as he could, but it had proven difficult. His adversaries had been keeping quiet. Too quiet. Gordon was in the atrium. The commissioner looked worn and rumpled as always. The cares of his position had aged him prematurely. So had his years of battling powerful interests who wanted the police to become their cat's paws, personal enforcers, rather than representatives of a law that applied equally to all. They had their differences, Batman and Gordon, yet he knew the commissioner was one of the few people in Gotham City who would always do what he thought was right, no matter the political cost, no matter what ridicule he had to endure from the media no matter what. In that way, Batman and Gordon were the same, and that was what bound them together in the battle against entrenched corruption and vice. Each could count on the other to be an ally, and Gordon was willing to accept the consequences of that alliance. The commissioner reached out to shake Batman's hand. Glad you came, he said. You know you can count on me, commissioner, Batman said. Gordon's grip was strong, and he looked slightly less worn than he had in recent months. Maybe things were changing. Quincy Sharp was mayor, and that wasn't necessarily good news for Gordon. But, with Tiger gone, the GCPD was no longer stuck on the sidelines. When under the influence of Hugo Strange, Sharp had replaced the police with Tiger, leaving Gordon powerless. It was a tribute to the man's character that he had continued to do his job, even with the odds stacked against him. More remarkable still, in Batman's mind, was the fact that the commissioner continued to associate with known vigilantes. There was a certain kind of law enforcement that could not wear a badge. Gordon recognized it, even if he didn't openly endorse Batman's tactics. It was the mark of a good man, a strong man, to admit that the world didn't always operate according to his ethics. What is it you need me to see? Batman asked. Gordon left the atrium, motioning for him to follow. He walked to the back of the building and up a rear fire stairwell. We keep a private conference room back here, he said over his shoulder. It seemed like a good place to, uh... Well, I'll just show you. On the third floor, down a dimly lit corridor, Gordon unlocked a door and stood aside so Batman could enter. The room was a simple rectangle, perhaps twelve feet by twenty, with blank walls and no windows. A table and chairs occupied the centre of the floor space. The table was empty, except for a single envelope. This was inside of an unmarked package. Uh, once I pulled it out, I didn't open it, Gordon said. As soon as I saw who it was addressed to, I brought it here myself and contacted you. Batman approached the table and assessed the envelope from arm's length. It was addressed plainly, in block capitals. Joker, care of Commissioner James Gordon, Gotham City Police Department. What he saw caused him to suppress a shudder that ran through his body, 
and he took a moment to focus. There was no return address and no postmark. Someone had slipped the envelope into the departmental mail system without using the post office. A fact that in and of itself was disturbing. Batman filed the fact away. You wore gloves? he asked. No point, Gordon replied. And by the time I'd picked it up and saw the address... His voice trailed off. After I put it in here, I call the decontamination crew. They douse me and they're in my office right now testing for toxins. Next, they're going to survey the mail room. I've got my shipping manager interviewing everyone who works down there to see what they might know. She's good people. I've got someone checking the security footage, too. Probably a good idea, Batman said, though he didn't mention that it was probably too late. If there was a toxin on the envelope, there was no way of telling how many people had handled it since its entry into the building. The subtle approach wasn't exactly the Joker's style, but he hadn't been above employing it. If, Batman thought, the Joker had anything to do with this at all. He had been dead four months. Gordon had personally supervised the cremation. This envelope hadn't been sitting in the GCPD mailroom all that time. So either one of its many minions had sent it, or it was a message from another of Gotham City's villains. My first guess would be that one of the Joker's henchmen sent it, Batman said. It wouldn't be unusual for him to have rigged something to be done in the event of his death, especially given the circumstances of his death. He knew he wasn't going to live, not without the antidote. I was thinking along the same lines, Gordon said, peering at the package. So what do we do? Where the Joker's involved, we hedge our bets. Batman unclipped a small device from his utility belt and turned it on. It was a portable X-ray machine customized to detect the presence of most common explosives and toxins, and even radioactivity. He held it out over the envelope, and an image appeared on its screen. It's a USB drive, he said. There doesn't appear to be anything else inside. He checked the readings. You can call off your decontamination protocol. Are you sure? Gordon asked. I'm responsible for people's lives here. So am I, Batman said. I don't see anything but an envelope. I'll have to open it to be sure. He reached for the envelope. Instinctively, Gordon backed up a step. The envelope had a pull tab. Batman pulled it, and at the end of the envelope tore open without incident. He gave it a shake, and the USB drive clattered onto the tabletop. It was plain black, and with a translucent plastic cap over the end that would plug into a computer. The stores of Gotham City sold these by the thousands. Could someone have sent this not knowing the Joker was gone? Gordon said. That doesn't make sense. Batman nodded. I agree. It's more likely that before he died he arranged to have it sent. He added. Whoever sent it, though, they wanted us to see what's on the USB drive. What better way to make sure it would get to us than to address it to that madman? So it's a game. We're being played. Gordon looked down at the drive. I'll bring in some of our computer people, if you think it's safe. Have them take a look. I'll take it myself, Batman said. If there are fail-safes, I'll get past them. And if there's any sort of virus on the drive, I'll take the risk. He picked up the tiny object. There's always the possibility that the drive can only be read once. If that's the case, my system will capture whatever is there before it can disappear. He could see that Gordon was conflicted. As the commissioner of the police, he was used to being in charge. Yet he knew that this was the best way to proceed. Batman's equipment was state-of-the-art, as compared to the police systems, which had been cutting edge sometime in the last century. Okay, he said after a pause. But you share everything with me. That has to be the deal. Understood, Batman said. He dropped the USB drive into a pocket on his utility belt. I'll be in touch as soon as I know anything. You know the way out, Gordon said. I know a numbers of way out, as a matter of fact, he replied wryly. But no, you don't need to escort me. 
I'm sure you have better things to do. With that, he turned to leave. Do I ever? Gordon sighed. But don't leave me hanging, Batman. I saw the Joker burn. Watched it with my own eyes as they flushed the remains. This, though, it's got me edgy. Let me know what you find out. You'll be the first to know, Batman said from the doorway. Then, he was gone. It was time to touch base with Oracle. RiderReport.com, posted by JKB, Wednesday, 9.46am. Hot one! The Batmobile's been spotted at GCPD headquarters. Batman himself went inside. He didn't talk to anyone on his way in, and didn't appear to talk to anyone on his way out, either. But the Rider Report has its sources, friends. Oh, yes, we do. And not all of them are chasing leads for Jack's TV show. We're hearing from inside police headquarters that Commissioner Gordon himself called the Batman in. They met for more than 20 minutes somewhere in the building. No one else was present. When Batman came out and left in the Batmobile, he wasn't carrying anything that our sources could see. Apparently, Commissioner Gordon hasn't spoken to the department about their discussion either. What was the topic? No one seems to know, but there were rumbles about something strange in the GCPD mail. That's unconfirmed, and for all we know, the commissioner just missed having Batman around. Maybe he called him in for brioche and coffee. Nah, writers' readers know something is up, and you better believe the writer report does too. We'll be on this story going forward. Batman's gone back to wherever he goes, but it won't be long before we get more on this story. Stay tuned, hit your refresh button, keep this tab open. Jack will follow up on his show later this afternoon. By then, the odds are good that there'll be a whole lot more to talk about. And that is the end of chapter two. Very interesting, that actually, that we had more of um, these articles coming out. And uh, really fascinating. One thing I love is that if you've listened to um, the audiobook we did of Resident Evil City of the Dead, that book begins with a bunch of articles to help give you some context about the book going forward, telling you what's been happening in Raccoon, uh, the reaction to the mansion incident, how it was covered up, what happened to stars. Um, But that all happens at the start and we never return to it. I'm very interested to see in this that we're coming back to it throughout the book. It'll be really fascinating to see how they go. Also, I love the the contrast between in Resident Evil, the book was written in 98, like the book set in 98. Um, so like it's articles from an actual newspaper, whereas here, what we're looking at, they have to give us the website rather than the name of the newspaper. Um, and you know, the fact that the guy's going, hey, stay tuned, hit the refresh button, keep the tab open. It's kind of fun that we're we're telling stories through newspaper articles, but we've had to update it a bit. Um, and even to this point, you know, this is already, it's Arkham Knights, so it's already in the time of kind of social media news, you know, so it's almost like, like us on Facebook, follow us on your favourite social media platforms to keep following the Rider Report, that kind of stuff. Really interesting. Okay, let's move on to chapter three. On the way back to the cave, Batman contacted Oracle and recounted what had occurred at GCPD headquarters. Robin and Alfred were waiting when he arrived, but he didn't say a word as he headed straight to the computer console. Without even sitting, he opened a connection to Oracle. Batman hadn't told Gordon he was going to bring in outside resources. For one thing, Gordon didn't need to know everything about what Batman did. More to the point, the commissioner did not know that Oracle was his daughter. It was an awkward situation, but Barbara had made it clear that she wanted it that way, and Batman was forced to honour her request. If the life they had chosen had taught him anything, it was that barriers between public and private identities were best kept impermeable. More often than not, selective information embargoes were key to good working relationships. He just hoped this one wouldn't come back to bite them on the arse. I'm knocking on your door, Oracle said. You going to let me in? Batman keyed in a long alphanumeric string that generated permissions for Oracle to remotely access one of the Batcave servers. That server was kept isolated from all of the other networked equipment and reserved for work on digital files most likely to be infected with malware or other computer contaminants that might be dangerous to the cave's control systems and archives. 
I appreciate you knocking, Batman said. It's nice that you're too polite to just let yourself in. For you, she said. Now, let's see what we're looking at. Batman inserted the USB drive into the terminal and watched as a directory spawned. The drive's firmware folder was labeled Ha Ha Ha. Next was Deleted. The third and final folder was called Tick Tock. Let me take a look before anyone opens those folders, Oracle said. In the cave, they waited. It didn't take her long. The firmware is normal boilerplate stuff. Any college kid could write it. Deleted has eight files in it, no extensions. I won't know what they are until you open them. Do you want to, or do you want me to take a look? Go ahead, Batman said. She did, arranging the windows in a double row on the display over the Batcave's main computer terminal. They're all corrupt, she said. No known file type. No clues in the file names. Tick-tock is an app. Batman scanned them himself, and at first glance he didn't see anything. Clicking on ha-ha-ha, he got nothing. The folder wouldn't even open. Let's look at Tick-tock, then, he said. Oracle did something remotely without opening the folder. It's completely self-contained, she said. You can run it if you want. As far as I can tell, it can't hurt anything. There's no way to be sure, though. He clicked on the app, and a timer display appeared in the upper right corner of the display. It read, Zero hours, two minutes, zero seconds. And then, Zero hours, one minute, fifty-nine seconds. Countdown, Robin said. But to what? Batman, you might want to get out of there, Oracle said at least for the duration of the countdown. I don't think so, he replied. If there was a direct threat, one of the scans would have detected something, but we came up blank. No, given the effort they put into it, whoever sent this wants us to see what's on this drive. And if there was data being stolen, we'd be aware of it before two minutes was up. One minute and thirty seconds, Alfred said. Sir? This is a countdown to something, Batman continued. Worst case scenario, the drive might be erasing itself. I'm not seeing any code that could do that, Oracle said. I still think you should be careful. Robin, Alfred, go if you think it's best. Batman looked at both of them. Neither moved. Don't put yourselves at risk just because you're too loyal. I don't believe there's such a thing as too loyal, Alfred said. Robin watched the timer count down. I think you're right, Batman. Tim was careful not to say Bruce, and the system altered their voices enough to prevent anyone from recognizing them. Batman thought Barbara might already know his true identity, but if she hadn't figured it out, though, there was no reason to offer it up. It's your funeral, Oracle said. Zero hours. Zero minutes and fifty-nine seconds. Batman brought the deleted files back to the top of the stack of windows. Oracle, he said. If we got less than a minute, let's make it count. There are files referring to Wondrous City here. Anything else you can piece together that does with that? Something about Tiger, Protocol 10, maybe Hugo Strange, or the Joker himself. The files are pretty scrambled, Oracle answered. There's a pattern that keeps repeating itself, though. Look what happens if I put them all together. On the screen, a new window spawned, showing a solid block of gibberish text. Highlighted throughout the block were eight separate occurrences of a nine-letter string of capital letters, one for each document. I am Larval. I am Larval? Robin read. Who's Larval? There are no other capital letters, Oracle said. Quick, in the 15 seconds you still have to live, what do you think that might mean? I think it means we have more than 15 seconds to live, Batman said. Otherwise, there's no point in giving us the puzzle to begin with. Zero hours, zero minutes, nine seconds. Well, I guess we're about to find out, Robin said, tension appearing in his voice. 
Oracle, you should know. Hush, she said. The counter reached zero. Nothing happened. Then, zero hours, 59 minutes, 59 seconds. What the hell? Well, Batman said. Whatever the counter represented, at least we know one thing it didn't mean. His fingers flew over the keyboard as he and Oracle ran simultaneous diagnostics on the sealed systems he used to access the information on the drive. Everything there was still intact. The computer had recorded no operations other than what he had instructed, meaning that no code hidden on the drive had executed itself. Unless... Whoever had written the code was a more skillful hacker than Batman had ever encountered. Was that a joke? Robin wondered. Or did something just go wrong? Why did it just start over if nothing happened the first time? Perhaps the countdown was a message of another sort, Alfred interjected. Perhaps we have yet to gather all the information we require to understand it. Begging your pardon? That's what I'm thinking, Alfred, Batman said. We have to be lacking some sort of critical information, though. Without the proper context, this is just a glorified stopwatch. He scanned the news feeds to see if anything major had occurred when the timer hit zero. Nothing. Nothing in Gotham City, or anywhere else for that matter. So he went back to the Wonder City document. Oracle, what if this isn't a corrupted text document? It could be a corrupted binary translation of an image file. Funny you should mention that, she said. I've been running four different decryption and recovery programs designed to reconstruct image files, and look what I found. On the display, the window full of nonsense text symbols faded away and was replaced with an image. It was a diagram. That's the steel mill, Robin said. More precisely, it's the cooling tunnels. Batman added, but they don't look the same as when I was hunting through them for the Joker. But the mill is decades old. This looks new. Is it a blueprint? Oracle asked. I don't have any records of construction permits being issued for Wonder City, Arkham City, or the steel mill. Anyone who would construct something like this wouldn't be going through the regular channels to obtain permits. Batman looked back at the string that had been repeated in the corrupt text. I am Larval. What would eight repetitions of that mean? Robin wondered out loud. Someone wanted to get a point across, that's for sure, Oracle observed. There's more to it. Those strings were inserted intentionally into the corrupted file. Batman considered their options. Robin, hit the streets. Take a look around Arkham City and see what you can find. This is an invitation and we can't afford to ignore it. Robin started to suit up. What am I looking for? He asked. Start in the steel mill. Observe and report any unusual activity. That place should be deserted, and there shouldn't be any tiger presence at all. Oracle. The whole area is abandoned, she confirmed. At least officially. But this is Gotham City. It's a safe bet that some of Hugo Strange's old facilities are being used, if you know what I mean. It never took long for criminals to move into abandoned places. That was true everywhere, but it seemed to happen faster in Gotham City. True enough, Batman said. Robin, stay in close contact. I don't like splitting up like this, but we need to get a handle on it and quickly. As soon as we think we know what this I am larval note is about, we'll update you. Got it, Robin said. He gave his bow staff a spin and headed out through a bat cave exit that led to an abandoned subway maintenance station on the river. I'll see what I can find about the Joker's remaining henchmen, Oracle said. We've done our best to keep tabs on them, but they fall between the cracks too easily. Could be they've been absorbed into another criminal gang. Good idea, Batman said. Oracle signed off and he stood looking at the display. The repetitions of I am larval stood out from the surrounding gibberish. There was an additional meaning there. If I may offer a suggestion, Alfred said after a minute. Of course. This has all the earmarks of a puzzle, Alfred said. Dare I say, a riddle? 
Batman nodded. That's what I'm thinking, too. We have three separate parts so far. The steel mill image, the timer, and I am larval. It may be four, Master Bruce, Alfred said. He leaned across the keyboard and opened a text window. With one finger, he tapped out, I am larval. Below that, he tapped out, Mara Villa. An anagram, sir. You're right. I had that thought, but I was thinking in English. Had a bit of Spanish from my youthful travels, Alfred said. Flash of insight. A fortunate one, Batman said. Mara Villa. Wonder. Eight times. The eighth wonder of the world, Alfred chuckled. Never thought I'd hear anyone say that about the Arkham City steel mill. I don't think they are, Alfred, Batman replied. But I think you're right about there being more pieces to this puzzle. And I think you're right about who sent it. So far, all the material on the USB drive had the hallmarks of the work of Edward Nigma, the Riddler. Nigma had left his mark all over Arkham City and parts of Gotham City during the Tiger Takeover and the final stages of Protocol 10. Batman remembered the Riddler's traps. Death rooms, he had called them. Annoying, but hardly a world-class threat. His train of thought was interrupted by a call on Commissioner Gordon's line. Batman answered, Commissioner. Batman, Gordon replied. Two things. First, I'm checking in to see what you've found. The waiting is driving me crazy. Have you learned anything about that USB drive? What does it have to do with that maniac, the Joker? At the moment, I suspect it has nothing to do with the Joker, Bruce said. That's the good news. He's dead and we can let him stay dead. Take your own advice, he said to himself silently as he went on. It's from someone else. Address the way to get your attention, and to get you to involve me. He changed the subject. Here's the other thing. You said there were two. About five minutes ago, a man named Lucas Angelo was murdered in broad daylight, shot from a rooftop with an arrow. It's an assassination. I don't mean to sound callous, Bruce said, but you don't call me about every murder in Gotham City. Was there... This was an assassination, Gordon said. And the reason I called you is that the word tick-tock was carved into the shaft of the arrow. It's got to be some kind of message. Tick-tock. Damn, that's it. Batman swiped windows away from the corner of the display, uncovering the timer app window. It was ticking down again. 54 minutes, 47 seconds. The timer window expanded and the line of text appeared below the countdown. Vault ahead! Don't get boxed in. You can bank on finding something to sink your teeth into. Commissioner, Batman said. I'm going to have to call you back. My, my, the plot thickens and the stakes get higher quite, quite quickly. The Riddler's game has already become deadly, and it seems that there is some form of vault, perhaps? Some sort of locked room, safe, something that Batman has to get into? Don't get boxed in, is what he said. Okay, I'm sure that will become clear as Batman cracks this puzzle. So let's move on to chapter 4, which I think is going to be the final chapter for this, our first part of the audiobook or fan read-along here on Fulcrum Entertainment. And now, thought the Riddler, things begin in earnest. So many interlocking plans, each time to activate at just the right moment. So many moving parts, each with its own function, and each depending on so many others. He had never attempted anything quite like this. The thought thrilled him. No one had ever done anything like this. There were puzzles within riddles, within conundrums, within enigmas. A clockwork masterpiece that depended on perfect timing. And, of course, on the indomitable will of Batman and Robin. 
It was the mark of genius to turn the enemy's signal virtue into his undoing. This the Riddler planned to do, and with the kind of panache that would make Gotham City stand up and take notice. It wasn't an easy thing, standing out from the crowd of misanthropy and violence in this particular town but he had found a way to do it. Oh, yes, he had. The timer was ticking, and he knew exactly what was occurring. Gordon had called Batman and Robin. He always summoned them when he was out of his depth. They knew now the seriousness of the situation. They would act quickly and proceed to the bank, to the vault and what it contained. Perfect! Parts of the magnificent puzzle were falling into place, while others already were beginning to unmake themselves. Sooner or later, Batman would understand that, and when he did, the second phase of the plan would activate itself. The Riddler watched and resisted the urge to rub his hands together in cartoonish glee. The first bait, and they had taken it. Before long, the hook would be well and truly set. Question marks and fish hooks. The resemblance was uncanny, he thought, and he filed it away. There was a riddle in that demanding to be found. Pity he hadn't thought of it for this endeavour. Another time, he mused. It's good to be thinking ahead, but let's not allow our attention to wander, just when it's required. His communications were in place, as was a set of superbly calibrated challenges. His pawns were in place. The opening move was complete, and now he had to wait for Batman to catch up, by playing the only moves he could play. The gambit was coming. He could hardly wait. Patience, he told himself. Would Batman interpret the signs correctly and respond to the gambit the way the Riddler had designed? I know you, Batman, he thought, far better than you know me, and that imbalance will be the difference that becomes your undoing. It's the tenth move that forces the checkmate in the fortieth. The real game was about to begin. A short time later, A lackey entered the Riddler's sanctum. He reported on their progress in locating the mechanical guardians. We've found five of them so far, the thug said. He was heavy set and didn't look as if he'd shaved recently. Excellent, the Riddler responded, smiling with undisguised glee. What sort of condition are they in? They all seem pretty much undamaged though we won't know for sure until we can turn them on. He grinned. It's lucky you got your hands on them when you did, he added. If the Joker had kept control over them, no telling how much damage he'd have done. If he was calling the shots, that'd be all she wrote. The smile disappeared from the Riddler's face. That will be all, he said, and the man looked startled. He turned to leave, approaching the door. Nigma shot him in the back. He collapsed without a sound. Two other nobodies rushed into the room, reaching for their guns. For a moment they looked stunned. Then they reached down and they grabbed the dead man by the arms. They dragged him out without uttering a word. And that is the end of chapter four. Very simple chapter there. Edward Nigma says, Ah ha 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 ha, I have plans, Batman as he always does. They do seem to be going his way. And then he just straight up murders a lad. And we are reminded that while he does seem a little bit goofy, and certainly in the games, you know, uh, the fact that there's kind of like little trophies and secrets to be found, uh, you know, the, um, what what do you call them? The Riddler trophies are almost like um, Korok seeds, like they are in Breath of the Wild in the uh, Gotham, sorry, Arkham City game. Uh, so, you know, you can kind of see him being a bit benign, a bit funny. I think they're trying to establish very early on, no, he will kill and does. All right. Well, that is the end of our episode for today. But to celebrate the opening weekend of 
uh, the Batman. We are releasing one of these each day this weekend. So there's one today on Friday. And we'll see you again tomorrow, Saturday, for the second part. And then I'll be back again on Sunday for the third part. And you can join us live on Sunday for the Fulcrum Entertainment Podcast, where we will review the movie. It's going to be quite a weekend. All right. So I will see you soon, but in the meantime, if you enjoyed this video, please do like it, and if you think you know someone who would love a bit of a Batman audiobook, please share it with them. And if you feel really generous, how about subscribing to us, and if you hit that bell icon, YouTube will actually tell you when we put out new videos, instead of just hiding us in your subscriptions without saying a word. Alright, see you tomorrow. Same bat time, same... Well, not Bat Channel, the Fulcrum Entertainment Channel, but, you know, the same channel. I'll see you then.